Good morning. We're going to start. I'm Laura Ritchie. This is Kate Bowles. We have Jeffrey Javalt is in Vermont watching online, I hope. Uh, he's sugaring at the moment, making maple syrup. And Tanya is um, in Canada, also hopefully catching us online. We're going to start with the video. Um, these are my words. Kate made the video. It's something she made a couple of years ago before we ever met in person. Oops, how do I make the video? Martin's going to save the day again. Is there sound? Yeah. Uh, oops, make it go to the next. No, I don't know how to stop. We'll get there. You're going to help me, Harry. Go to the next slide. Thank you. Sorry. That was a gift. Um, I had written a, a small story, and that's the one of the important things about this talk. We're talking about the pedagogy of small. How do small stories and our stories, and it's very ironic that we're in this gigantic room and you're all very far away, but actually this is the up close and personal of online. What are the values? How do we share things? Why do we do this? And what does it give us? Small is a different model. We've heard about how we're, we're challenged and charged with being aware of what we do, our relationships with open, the platforms we use, the way we do things. And actually, if you remove yourself from the really big, then it affords different opportunities to the users and the principles are very different than a corporatized world. You suddenly find that there's a willingness to engage in a different way when you know that you're not the product and you're not being monetized. The four of us wrote a chapter in a book about this, and we found that some of the principles were based on another author. He found, Paquette found these value pairs within these communities, and they, they do stand separately, but they also are very intertwined. You find autonomy. You are your own. You're in control of what you do, yet you're within a community. The negotiation of how to work with others and how to create a sort of a place where you can exist in harmony is very important. You have the freedom to do things. And this, in an educational context, we looked at two different settings. One, a school setting that was online, removed from the actual education setting, and one, a completely social platform that was not intended to be an educational platform, but in both we found that there is this freedom and responsibility for the users. Freedom being freedom of speech, freedom of expression, but the responsibility is a collaborative responsibility for how our things run. What do you tolerate? What do you not? What do you want in your community? And that also links directly into the democracy and participation. Because if you don't have a formalized structure imposed around you, it's up to you to create the rules and to work it out. So. One example, Jeffrey in 2006 in Vermont founded the Young Writers um, Program and he, basically it's an online platform where um, students aged 13 to 19 could come and have their own space to write. 
They write poems, short stories, it's multimedia, there's audio, there's visual, and they critique one another, they comment about things. He was asked, how do you deal with bullying? He said, there is none, actually, because the students self-moderate. There are mentors as well, so you can have uh, people who are not staff members, but for example, I was given a mentor account and I could comment on other people's things. So there's a, a, a community. But this I thought was a nice picture. It's Jeffrey, he posted this a couple of um, weeks ago. This is where he does his sugaring in Vermont. And he posted as an aside comment the, I don't like walls. They hide the light in the open air. But this was something that we also found in the online setting. The idea of open, and when it's truly open, it enables all sorts of activity. The learners tend to then negotiate with their environment and they create their community. The other platform that we looked at was Mastogen. Now, some people use Twitter. I have a presence on Twitter, but I don't post much stuff. I don't. And it may be that actually you're, you're like this king daddy surfer and you can negotiate all that stuff and do it. Other people need sort of more still waters. And I think it's important sometimes to notice, and whether that's the fast noticing or the slow noticing, if you can notice the people around you and what they have to offer, then you may find huge connections come from that. So my contribution to this is to talk a little bit about my practice in using stories and teaching. Uh, I work uh, using storytelling mode in undergraduate education in both large and relatively smaller classes. And I work with um, a narrative mode that allows students to explore their own values and develop their own uh, learning path by using the stories that they tend to tell about themselves and their everyday lives and from that to derive a sense of purpose about what they intend to do next. The reason I'm including the world's uh, famous, most famous short story here is that this is not what we do. Uh, this is an incredibly, uh, it's a notorious piece of brief fiction. I think it's Hemingway-esque in every possible way. And this is not what a small story is. This is a piece of uh, flash fiction. And the, the reason why you know it's not what a, sto a small story is in the way that we're talking about is that it's overthought. It's um, almost hysterically over-designed to pull off a trick that makes you sit back and think, ha-ha. You got me. Nevertheless, people love six-word stories. There are six-word stories all over the internet. Jesse Stommel has used this, I think, very well in his hashtag forward pedagogy, which pops up from time to time. So we're asked to use a discipline of brevity, a sort of haiku but much smaller, to say something meaningful. 
But a small story in the way that I think of it, and I use it in my teaching, is uh, actually a much more easygoing mode to work in. We tell small stories all the time. You will have told so many stories since you've been here to each other, about each other, uh, in your own head, to your families back home. This little thing happened. How weird was that? Um, I'll tell you a small story that yesterday Laura dropped Francis and I off uh, in Galway and we walked with great confidence aided by Francis's Google Maps in entirely the wrong direction for a really, really long time. And after a while I said to Francis, we were going along like Pooh and Piglet, and I said, Francis, are we going in the right direction? You know, no, absolutely not. So we walked all the way back and it was a complete delight because Francis and I had been looking for time in one another's company and Google Maps gave it to us. So, small stories are composed of the things that we tend to notice, the little details in the everyday. Noticing is something that you have to learn how to do. They tell us what we're thinking about and what we value, and they help us to notice that we are practicing our values in action. To return to the quote that I put in my keynote yesterday, uh, for me, using story work like this in pedagogy is part of a moral moment pedagogy. It's understanding that when I stand in front of a student or a student stands in front of me, we are making a decision about how open to be with one another, what to say about our lives, what to disclose, what to protect, what to withhold. It's never a simple decision. And I think the kind of story work that we allow in teaching is a tremendous ethical responsibility because we have an ethical responsibility not to spill ourselves all over other people but at the same time to listen intently when they are trying to tell us a truth. We've planned to do a very small exercise at this point and uh, sort of somewhat glibly said to each other, marching in, well, this is what we do on Mastodon. Hey, why don't we do it on Twitter? And as we were sitting there, I said to Laura, you know what, there's a reason that we do it on Mastodon. Uh, if you haven't been on Mastodon and you're interested in taking a look, or if you've been and you've gone and you haven't come back, which is a thing that happens with Mastodon, go and take another look. One of the things that I've found in having a significant uh, part of my life on Twitter and a significantly hidden part of my life on Mastodon is that for reasons that connect to what Bon Stewart was talking about yesterday, I think Mastodon is an effort to build the pro-social web. And that means that for all sorts of odd reasons, it feels a bit safer in there to speak openly about who I am, what I'm seeing in the world, what I'm noticing, and what I'm thinking about. So rather than asking you to tell a small story about OER19 on Twitter, where this would go out to your boss, uh, some of your students, people that don't even like you, we should take much more care with the stories that we tell. I think maybe consider popping into mastodon.social and having a go. You can find us both there, where under our own names you can find the hashtag and you'll find all sorts of stories told there. The critical thing about a small story which is connected to small pedagogy is that it is a very modest practice. It is a modest and humble way of learning from one another because of the simple humanity that we share. I wanted to close, uh, this is a very kind of brief presentation, it's a small presentation, um, with this beautiful quote from uh, David Foster Wallace's well-known keynote, This is Water. Uh, I love this keynote. Uh, I think that he does some really great thinking in it. Um, but this is probably the pivotal moment for me. Learning how to think means learning how to exercise some control over how and what you think. Being conscious and aware enough to choose what you pay attention to, and to choose how to construct meaning from experience. I've recently been told uh, by a close friend of mine that Simone Weil described attention as the purest form of prayer. As a very secular person, I initially rocked a bit. I wasn't quite sure what to do with something that was, combined, was compared to with prayer. But I think that attention is the way that we express hope for the world that we live in, by noticing the small details, the underfoot, the unrecorded, we will, I think, be able to make some headway on the larger project. Thank you. Any comments, questions, thoughts?
If you're just reflecting in silence, that's okay too. Uh, just to say that I'm feeling uh, mobilized by uh, the f uh, strongness of small pedagogy concept. I think it's a uh, and, and the way uh, we have to shi shift and turn open education, community-based, it's not global. Thank you. I wanted to let you know about one of the students that I've worked with who's now in her uh, first year of her PhD. She's researching the way families who have experienced significant illness, who have received a, a, a serious diagnosis, use a small story's pedagogy to uh, make sense of the medical information that they're being given. So she's uh, working out as a researcher how to sit with families in a time of crisis and hear how they tell the story of what did the doctor say, uh, what's going to happen next, what are we going to do, but remember that time when. And her thesis, which is very beautiful, so big shout out to Jivani Witheridge, um, her thesis work has taken this small stories pedagogy out of the classroom into a practical project with our local hospital, which I think will have significant impact on the way clinicians understand family and carer relationships around information. There's also the thing to think about in the small, the activities that we do as the ordinary, the noticing the ordinary, the ordinary are what build up the big things. It's not just the, I've got a PhD, but it's, I actually, I got out of bed and I, I thought about it. You know, I, I opened the book and I read it. And those may sound like that's so basic, but actually those are the important things, the getting started. So that small is important. Okay. Um, I, I, yesterday when we were having a um, uh, uh, I think it was one of the panels that were, I was in, and um, we were talking about managing risk in open, and it made me think about students, and when we ask students to put their work out there, the, the duty of care that we have to make sure that they're in a safe environment and that we don't tie them to saying things that then become part of their footprint for the future, and, and things like that. Do you think that these are inherently safer spaces for students? I think that they're inherently more conscious spaces for people, I wouldn't say they're for students or for teachers or for anyone. So, for example, on Mastodon, you choose to whom you share your writing. Most of the things I write do not appear in the public timeline, but they appear, um, they're not, um, they're not, they don't, they don't fit in the, the big stream. You can choose public, um, uh, private, your followers only, or direct messages. You know, somebody could find you if they're really looking, but you're not going to be there on the, on the shop floor. With the Vermont Writers um, Project, there were 40,000 users, and none of them were made to be users. It was yeah. started in 2006, but they had about 4,000 per year active users. Um, and it's voluntary. So there was no requirement, there were no assessments, there were no guidelines of you must do this. And I think that's an important thing, that people are not made to do things, but also there's a strong awareness within each of the communities of a code of conduct. And they're devised um, Mastodon's not one thing like Twitter, it's federated, lots of small instances, mm. and each one is a community with their own guidelines. Mm. So it's certainly food for thought there for me. Okay, uh, we're actually out of time now, so uh, I will say thank you very much for a really stimulating presentation, and to our other presenters for really giving us a, such a rich understanding of the ecosystem and what we might be mean by that. So thank you very much. Thank you.